Hello and welcome everyone. I am Adil from API Matic. Anybody here who does not know which place is this? Who doesn't know? You don't know, okay. Anyone who knows it? Of course, Hobbiton or the land of hobbits, that's the home of API Matic and I came from New Zealand on Sunday to present here in front of you, thanks for coming. So we are almost at the end of this session, which was about developer experience, SDKs. We have heard some, you know, quite nice, you know, thoughts about SDKs using them and I will elucidate, you know, some more over there. So let's first see how many developers are there in the world. According to Stack Overflow, there are over 50 million developers in the world among which 21 million are called, called professional, while the rest of them are hobbyists or like me. So since we are talking about developer experience, I was interested to know, like those 50 million developers, they have evolved over many decades. So what used to be developer experience like 50 years ago, when developers used to like write in machine code and assembly code? And I'm going to ask a question. I don't expect anyone here to be familiar with machine code, but in case if there is some ancient developer here, can you guess which function or method this machine code is depicting? Who said hello world? <laughs> no, that's not hello world. So this uh, function is a simple swap function you can see the assembly code as well as high level language code for uh, you know the same function over there and why i put it over there because developers nowadays write their programs in high level language which gets compiled assembled and linked into machine code which is understood by your machines why don't developers still write in machine code because it's not creative it's not unique and we want developers to work on the creative bit, which is the design logic or the business logic, while abstracting out all the intricacies, all the details from developers and doing it for them. And that's been the principle of developer experience for a very long time. That is, let developers focus on what is creative while abstracting out whatever is redundant. So bringing the same developer experience to the API world, how companies are doing it, how developers are doing it. So I have compiled a list of APIs which, has, you know, which have massive developer traction. Of course, the name is here. You can see Twilio, Stripe, Algolia, Keen, Facebook. And you can see they are able to attract a huge number of developers. Like Twilio, I remember I said that it's been accessed by a million developers every day. So what kind of components they are providing to help all those developers using the APIs? And you can find the synergy over here in the components. You can see HTTP reference everyone is providing, code samples, tutorials, official SDKs. And just look at the number of languages they are providing SDKs. I know there has been skepticism on SDKs. I have heard in this session as well, but just look at this. The successful APIs, what things they are providing over there. So the, the problem comes up. Let's have a look what's happening. What developers should be doing with APIs? So there are two kind of developers. The first set is sitting in house within your company. And the other set is the consumers, the app developers who are using your APIs. So what developers should be doing in, like the in-house developers, the API developers should be designing and developing a APIs, which is creative bit. While the consumers should be designing and developing apps, which is again creative, but what they end up doing is this. Writing the code samples, developing SDKs again and then again and again. And I heard the guy from, the guys from, I guess, Trulio, the company name, like, the GitHub, at GitHub, you can see a, a, a SDK over there and an open issue for two years. Why? Because writing SDKs is not difficult, but maintaining it over time is super hard. I was reading a survey that around 83% of the time, 
goes in maintaining SD cards or client libraries, while just 17% of the whole air time is you know, spent in creating them. On the other hand, you can see the app, the app developers, they are focused on you know, wondering how to communicate with the API, how to deal with the OAuth two-legged uh, flow, how to bring in the tokens, how to keep them refreshed. So if we are able to provide these sort of things for developers, that, make, that can make their life much easier. So the second, or you can see in the red down there, these steps are redundant and can be automatically generated. So what we say that for a premium developer experience, remove redundancy via automation. And uh, this kind of automation has been achieved and you know some great companies are doing it already. So to understand a little better, let's go behind the scenes of an API call. So at the very basic level, an API call is a set of input and output. The input components are typically configuration, arguments, and the authentication credentials. And when an API receives these components and we make an API call, then that call goes through a series of steps. Those steps are checks and validations, in the encoding of the input, serialization, building of HTTP request, making the actual call, taking the response back, deserializing the body, decoding to output, handling error, and return the response. So there are two sets of steps. One is over here on the left, and the other one on the right. What an SDK does, an SDK actually encapsulates all these steps into a box so that developer can focus on the things which are really creative. And these steps can be automatically you know, uh, handled by the machine. Now there's a difference between API wrappers and SDKs. So if you call an SDK which just you know, take care with HTTP calls and serialization, deserialization, you can call them, but that's merely an API wrapper. But if you're doing more than that, you are adding checks and validations, you're adding analytics, you're adding caching, retries, then those SDKs become much more meaningful. And you know, that's what we believe at APIMatic and what we do over there. The second bit, code samples, which is the quickest path to hello world, as well as an essential companion to your SDKs. And uh, I see if a lot of companies are not even providing SDKs, but they do provide code samples. And uh, not everyone, but the majority of code samples, maybe like more than 90%, suffer from two problems. One, the current uh, code samples are static. You cannot change them. And second problem is they are non-runnable. Non you cannot basically, you know, run them live and make the API call. And for the best developer experience, what kind of code samples are important? The code samples should demonstrate actual and non-theoretical uh, uses of an API. They should be runnable, and they should come with an API, uh, come with code playground. What do I mean by this? Let me show you. So I made actually some slides to you know, demonstrate that, but last night I came up with a live example of a customer, and that's a very beautiful example of code samples, and I'm going to show you live over here. Yeah. So this is Earthport API, which is a visa company, a FinTech company. So this is a user's endpoint group, and I am clicking the create user endpoint. The three column design on the left, you have the list of endpoints, here the description, the end console, and on the right you can see the code, uh, a code sample, and which is runnable. Now, this console is showing me two kinds of parameters. One are, uh, one kind is optional, and the other ones are uh, mandatory. So account currency here is a mandatory one, I need to have over there, but the user ID is optional. If I take it out, you know, you can see on the right the code has been, you know, gone. And uh, 
Similarly, the pair identity is also, you know, uh, non uh, is an optional one. If I come down, if I take out address from here, you can see it, it's gone. Similarly, if I go down, if I click birth information. So now you can see the country of birth is a required property. For example, if I write New Zealand, it's also telling me it should not be longer than two characters. So that kind of validation is actually helping developers and they are not basically reading a huge bunch of, you know, text. They are doing it live and seeing it live, you know, what's valid, what's not. Similarly, city of birth is not, you know, a mandatory while identification is optional. Suppose if I add new kind of ID and if I give here some number, so it has taken it and if I have one more ID, I can add it right over here. I can, you know, change the order, make it up or down, or I can, you know, remove these. As I am writing, as I am typing over here, you can see that the code is being generated over there and this could go on. Now imagine this amount of information, if a technical writer is writing in plain language, how long would it take and how difficult it would be for a developer, new developer to understand that if I have an X parameter, I, I can use Y as an optional but not Z. If I'm using Y, then A, B, C of Y have these kind of requirements. So all that text can be saved if we let them play with the API with the code playground. And over there, you know, the best kind of language a developer understand is this, the language of code. Instead of, and there's a survey, I guess by Twilio, that when they had a bunch of lines before code samples, those code, code samples were not a lot, not adopted a lot. And, and the, the code samples which only contain code, that made a lot of sense for developers. That's how, you know, they, they understand, they envision, you know, uh, uh, the code like this and uh, in the configuration yeah one more thing it's runnable it's it's complete for example if i click show complete file over here in the code sample now it has added the dependencies has added the namespaces and this becomes a complete app a complete first hello world program so if I try it out, if I add, you know, OAuth token over here, which I don't have, and if I try it out, it should call the API and tell me, you know, what's the problem or not. It should give me an error. But, but the concept is, you know, you have, uh, you might have uh, received that let developers focus on the creative bit and just do everything else for them. So I am now just, you know, ditching the slides, we call dynamic and interactive code samples. So I am just, okay. Okay. The last bit which I want to touch here is a technique called continuous code generation, which actually solves a problem of uh, the, the developers who are sitting within your orga organization because the generation of code is not bad. SDKs are really helpful, but the problem comes when you try to maintain them, when you don't have resources to maintain them, when you have an API up to date, but the SDKs are lagging behind for a year or two. So continuous code generation is a technique which we use in house at API-matic to keep our docs and our SDKs up to date and is nothing, you know, fancy, but a DevOps technique to generate, build, test, and deploy SDKs and docs. So let us understand the problem here. You have an API which is connected to front end, which might be written in Angular, and connected to back end, which might be a bunch of microservices written in Java, Python, and other technologies. And the API is also connected to an API portal, public facing or internal API portal which has got SDKs in multiple languages, code samples and documentation, et cetera. Now, if you update a single parameter in an endpoint of this API, which is causing a, which can cause a breaking change, 
what will happen? What will happen is that you need to go to your front end guys, notify them, okay, I have updated my API. Can you please update your code? Go to back end guys and let them know the same. Then go to API portal, let your technical writers know, let your SDKs people know. If you have contractors outside, let them know, okay, I have, you know, updated my API. Can you please regenerate everything and republish it? That's been problematic. So how can that be solved is using the technique called code ge continuous code generation. And see this, this is the classic DevOps cycle. You can see the steps of coding, then building, testing, and deploying. Whenever something changes, all these four steps, they, they repeat, and that's very classic uh, DevOps cycle. In case of API, what we think, what we believe, that this client code generation can also be automated. Over here you can see, out of these four steps, only coding is the manual bit, while we have great tools to, you know, to automatically build, test, and deploy. But for API code, if we can automate the client code generation bit as well, we can have a complete automated DevOps cycle over here. So instead of manual work, we can automatically generate client code. At API Matic, what we do, we build it using Jenkins, test it using Travis, and deploy it on GitHub and RubyGem, publish them over there. And whenever API changes, we do it all the time. And the key to all of this is a machine readable description in, in, in the middle. So just update the machine, just keep the machine readable description up to date and put that into your CI or CD cycle and everything can be automatically generated. I actually have a demo of six minutes which I recorded. Uh, so if I have time, I will show that as well. Like, you know, starting from a machine readable description, publishing a portal, SDKs, and automatically updating them. So how we do at API Matic at the back? What's happening at the back? So whenever API description changes, we import and validate using an API. Then there's a code generation API which generates SDKs and code samples. Then a package publishing API publishes on NPM, NuGet, and other repos. Git deployment API publishes on GitHub. Docs generation API uh, generates docs and publish doc API, publish on, on uh, uh, you know, uh, on internet, or if you have some embedding, embeddable portal, you can publish them over there as well. So towards conclusion, if API is a product, SDK is the interface. In normal products, we have, you know, uh, interfaces which enhances our user experience for APIs, we have SDKs, which are responsible for the developer experience. So your developer experience should be using your API like they use any other product. Let them build their own interface. It's not a good idea. Instead, give them what they need to get started. Let them focus on what they are building, what is creative. And very important bit, know your audience, speak their language. And you can see the distribution of the developers over here. And imagine if you're not speaking a particular language, you might be missing that community to your competitors. And how powerful is the concept of speaking, the concept of speaking the language is my final slide, where Nelson, Nelson Mandela says, if you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. But if you talk to a man in a language which is his native, that goes to his heart. Developers are no different. So speak their language and you know, get their love back. Thank you. Adil, please show us your six minutes demo, please. <laughs> okay, if we don't we have any questions. We are keen to see it. Okay, sure. Anybody wants to see that as well? Actually, I played that live in Singapore API days. That happened two months ago, three months ago. So, yeah. No, no, I, I will do my own audio. <laughs> so what I'm going to show you, show you here is a, an API description, which has test cases. And uh, I will automatically generate a portal out of it. 
And uh, then I will make some changes in the API description. And uh, that changes will be reflected to the new portal. I will add a new GitHub repo from scratch, uh, which will be empty. But when I update my API description, it will populate new code and automatically deploy into GitHub, as well as create a new package on NPM and, and deploy that as well automatically. So how it's going to happen? So this is a calculator API which has, which has got two parameters. One is X, second is Y. So I am adding test cases to it with two numbers, X is four. Yeah, so operation is multiply, X is four, Y is five, and the expected body is 20, of course. Now I have imported that into API-matic, and I can see from my editor, if I click on test cases, I can see the test case is imported well. And the parameters are here. The expected body is there as 20. I can have multiple options of you know, for having native keys and other things. All good, let me hit click generate. So I have multiple options when I click generate. I can generate API portal, I can download a zip file or deploy at GitHub or publish a package. So this is the portal which is automatically generated using machine readable description. Clicking on .NET, it has taken me to this uh, interface and this get calculate. Remember the name, get calculate of the endpoint. I'm going to change it. So I am now going to console. I can see the multiply uh, function. I can select subtract some other. And uh, if I click on show complete file, it will show me the complete code sample on the right. And if I hit try it out, it should give me the sum of, yeah, the numbers which I put it, put, pasted at console. I'm going back. So if I change multiply, uh, you know, now I'm going to, you know, make some changes to the portal. Over here, what can I do? I can simply, you know, add, you know, different descriptions. And if I'm go to the, going to the docs section, I'm going to deal with the languages. And here's my script. And I'm going to add a new GitHub repo. I need to create one first. I'm sure you're all familiar with GitHub. So your point of view is Java underscore API days underscore Singapore. Yeah. So this, yeah, creating the repo over here and taking the URI to my script. Click languages, go to GitHub links go to Java, I can see here, uh, let me update that. Yeah, so it's now linked with the newly created repo. Whenever I update it, it will automatically publish the code and update it in, the, in my you know, GitHub repo. So I can see here, it's been changed to view source instead of download zip file. Now, going back, okay, I'm publishing it. This calculator demo. API days underscore SG, underscore is not allowed, okay. Yeah, so this is a publicly hosted portal which was automatically generated 100% using a machine, machine, machine readable description. Now you can see, if I click Java, this download SDK will become view source. If I click on it, it's pointing me to the newly created repo which is uh, empty. Now what I'm going to do, I am going to add this, this URI to my configuration and the package name which I want uh, an NPM uh, package to be automatically generated and published at the repo, which is compiled one, API days SG. Now saving the script and uh, now look at this change. Just making a very simple change, changing the name of calculator calculator for API days, and now saving it, committing it, and now pushing it, push, pushing the changes. One more thing, since I have test cases, 
So I am adding my GitHub repo to Travis so that those test cases I can run and evaluate whether you know uh, those are running fine. So I am finding my repo. SG Java API guess SG yeah turned it on. So now when I, when my SDK will be compiled the test cases will be you know run against those uh, you know test information and I will get the status. So we have added that with uh, our slack so it, it let us know whenever you know some some build server is uh, kicking off. Okay so it will take few more seconds and uh, waiting anxiously. So now I have refreshed the portal and if I click simple calculator now you can see the name change get calculate for API days. I have not changed it manually it's an automatically. Now this this repo contains new code new docs everything automatically generated and populated if I update something it will generate again. I can go simply you know inside the folder you can see one minute ago. If I click on node.js now you can see its view package it is pointing me out to npmjs.com and you can see a published a minute ago API day Singapore. So all the you know that compiled binary in uh, npmjs. The last bit test cases and actually I was nervous when it was running live because I didn't, need, didn't knew that like <laughs> if it was all going good or not. So running for 41, 42 seconds. Now I know how much second it will take. I guess 54 it was. <laughs> there you go. In 53 seconds, all things are done. It's been you know uh, the tests are passed. The new you know, repos are created, published in uh, you know on GitHub, published at NPM JS, and my portal is up to date. So it took around like six minutes. Uh, you know for the whole demo and imagine how much time it can save for your internal team if you are going for a strategy of SDKs. Thank you very much. So I am all here for <laughs> question answers. Thank you Adil. Amazing. So still room for questions. First question here. Hi. Um, I just have a question about where does the playground actually works with it? Does it has its own side up running or will it actually load into the original application? You know, yeah, that's part of, uh, you know, the console. So, you know, if you are going for SDKs, so SDKs and code samples or like the playground, they are bundled together. You can host that from scratch on an HT on, on you know uh, wherever you want or you can embed that on any HTML page. So that's basically JavaScript that will render it to on your client side. More questions there behind. Um, we are in the era of the microservices and um, in, of course in, in a company there are multiple teams building this uh, microservices and uh, on the APIs and eventually they're maintaining their own swagger and uh, or the blueprint documentations. Um, if you take a scenario of like okay in a company there are like 10 teams building um, each of 10 microservices then it, you have like 100 APIs around that. Yes. Um, so how do we actually take all these uh, swaggers or blueprints and then uh, there is within that one there will be public and private APIs for uh, external facing and the internal facing. Um, so how do we actually take all these and merge it, all these swaggers and into one uh, mega swagger and then we, we expose that to the external world only the public APIs. Yeah, you know that's been a very classic problem we have found in, in enterprises. So there's a feature called merging and uh, yeah, so what you can do, uh, so at APMatic we have this feature available, I can give you a demo outside this and if you want to do it yourself this is something you know a little hard, a little hard problem to crack at enter enterprises but it's, it's, it's doable and uh, you know just take some you know 
uh, some algorithm to just, you know, uh, keep all the files together and put it in the in 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 right way. So yeah, it, it's doable. It's called a merging feature, which comes, which is a part of our SDK code generation. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Adil. You're very welcome. <laughs>